Hello, I'm Manoj Karmakar. Welcome to ISSPS TV. If you haven't subscribed as yet, do remember to subscribe so that you can get regular notifications of any future uploads. In this next video, I'm going to be discussing with you Osteoclavicular Brachial Plexus Block. All that you need to know about this technique from its inception to our current understanding today. Next, uh, uh, I'm going to cover another <coughs> topic that also comes from our stables in uh, our hospital in the Prince of Wales, where we evaluated or we uh, defined the costoclavicular brachial plexus block. It's slowly becoming a technique of choice by not only for upper extremity surgery, but many are also using it for shoulder surgery. So um, in order to really understand this, uh, you have to understand the block in detail. Before I begin, I like to again declare I have no conflict of interest, but whenever you see this red star, do pay attention because it is highlighting an important take home message. So uh, this is uh, going to be the message for you. The, the red star will be the take home message. So my objective is uh, to demonstrate to you how ultrasound imaging is really helping us refine regional anesthesia. Uh, like I mentioned to you uh, previously about the suit, the SETB, and now costoclavicular brachial plexus block. And there are many other techniques that other researchers have refined in, the, in our literature. So firstly, in order to understand this, we need to understand why you need a uh, another brachial plexus block, whether it's called costoclavicular brachial plexus in this case. I will then discuss the relevant anatomy, the ultrasound imaging technique with the sono anatomy, and then um, uh, present to you the block dynamics that a costoclavicular brachial plexus does, and then review the literature for you, including present some of our own work as to how it compares with other traditional techniques. Now, when you do a costoclavicular brachial plexus block, it's a proximal infraclavicular brachial plexus block targeting the cause of the brachial plexus at the costoclavicular space. Now, if I asked you, what is the most popular infraclavicular brachial plexus block technique that you are aware of? I think the majority would say that it is the lateral sagittal infraclavicular brachial plexus block technique. In this, you perform a sagittal scan at the, at the lateral infraclavicular fossa, like so, uh, whereby you are visualizing the cause of the brachial plexus underlying the pec major and the minor muscle. To your left is cranial, to your right is caudal, and you visualize the second part of the axillary artery, and the cords are usually aligned along in relation to this second part of the axillary artery. It's usually described that the lateral cord is about nine o'clock position, the posterior cord is at six o'clock position, and the medial cord is between the axillary artery and vein. And some of the basis of performing the lateral sagittal infraclavicular brachial plexus block and its simplicity is related to this, that. So if you can perform a periarticular injection around the second part of the axillary artery, in majority, 95% of individuals, you will be able to block the lateral, posterior, and the middle co medial cords, and therefore it'd be effective to produce brachial plexus anesthesia, and therefore effective for surgery at the elbow or below the elbow. So this is just a video to show you using a high-frequency linear transducer in a sagittal plane. Uh, in our case, we have the arm abducted. Uh, to about 90 degrees, where you can now see from uh, anterior to posterior, the pec major and the minor, and dip to it is the second part of the axillary artery. But now, ladies and gentlemen, you may be wondering, where are the three cords that I showed you in the, in the cartoon? In fact, in this, um, in this uh, sagittal sonogram, you'd, you'd agree if I said that you can only see one of the cords here. And because of its position, we can say that this is indeed the lateral cord. The other cords are often not so clearly visualized in most individuals. 
So therefore, there lie certain limitations of performing lateral sagittal infraclavicular brachial plexus block. Firstly, the cords are located at a depth, usually much deeper than a supraclavicular or an uh, interscalene uh, brachial plexus block that we discussed previously. More importantly, the cords are often separated from one another, and there is literature that has demonstrated that there are wide variation in the position of the cords at the lateral sagittal infraclavicular fossa. And as I also showed you that three cords are rarely visualizing in a single sagittal ultrasound window. That doesn't mean that you can't identify the three cords. If you do a dynamic scan proximally and distally, and you're familiar with the anatomy of the cords from a proximal to a distal side, then you can track the individual cords and then you can then say for sure, yes, this is the posterior cord and this is the medial cord. So therefore, again, having a systematic scanning approach is very vital when you are looking for the three cords at the lateral sagittal infraclavicular fossa because they will not be saying, hello, I'm here, because you'll have to find them in their respective positions. It is for this reason, relatively large volumes of local anesthetics are used to circumvent the inability to identify these cords, hoping that large volumes will spread to these um, cords and produce the blockade. And also multiple injections have been shown to be more effective than a single injection. Now, when you use a catheter, where do you place a catheter? Now that you have three cords, so it's usually placed at the posterior part of the of the axillary artery that's usually at about six o'clock position you place the needle like so from a cranial to caudal direction and you place it at six o'clock hoping that it would um, encompass all the three cords the local anesthetic would now the problem with that is that when you do a primary block you inject a large volume so you get a very effective primary brachial plexus block however in the post-operative period when you run infusions of about six to 10 mils, um, usually 0.1 to 0.2 mils per kilo per hour, then you have regression of the primary block. And often there will be secondary block failure in the territories of the lateral or even the, post, uh, even the uh, medial cord in that respect. So therefore, one of the limitations of uh, lateral sagittal infraclavicular continuous techniques are the secondary block failure is very, very common. Furthermore, uh, you can see here that the minimum effective volume that is often required to produce infraclavicular brachial plexus at the lateral sagittal is about 35 ml. Now, that's uh, <clears throat> an exceedingly large volume given today's um, practice of using relatively small volumes of local anesthetics. <clears throat> so in my review of the literature, I found that actually the lateral sagittal infraclavicular fossa is not a very a good location when you come to performing a brachial plexus block. When you have uh, other sites which are more proximal, where the three cords are more uh, clustered together and are more easily accessible at a more superficial location. So therefore, um, in this letter to the editor, we wrote saying that the costoclavicular space is uh, a more desirable location to perform infraclavicular brachial plexus block. Because you can see here, that the cords of the brachial plexus are indeed clustered together and they're very consistently um, anatomy uh, in this costoclavicular space. And I will come to that in a moment. It is indeed deep to the clavicle and posterior to the clavicle between the subclavius muscle and the serratus anterior. Now, in this case, you can see these are the upper slips of the serratus anterior that often overlie the second rib. And this is often referred to also as the serratus magnum. Uh, uh, as uh, Kevin had uh, alluded to in his uh, presentation with the long thoracic uh, nerve. So <clears throat> when you talk about the costoclavicular space, um, say four or five years ago, it was really poorly understood in the anesthesiology literature, despite the fact that uh, in the radiology literature is quite commonly described, as you can see here, Dr. Demondian and their, and their colleagues in radiology have indeed described the costoclavicular space as a space deep and posterior to the clavicle where the cords are clustered together lateral uh, to, the, to the first part of the axillary artery. So when you, when you consider costoclavicular, people ask me, how did you think about this? I said, I never thought about this. I, it was not my discovery. I just found the literature and I found that there was a location 
that was so close yet so far from the lateral sagittal uh, infraclavicular fossa that I thought would be more conducive uh, when you wanted to produce brachial plexus block, which is reliable, which is consistent, and would block all the three cords of the brachial plexus. So you can see here, the five represents the, uh, the uh, posterior cord, the six represents the lateral cord, and the seven represents the medial cord. So if you look at the anatomy that I will be describing shortly, it is indeed very consistent, and this is the arrangement that you will see consistently from one patient to another. So as you can see in this uh, cadaver um, uh, dissection, if you may, this is uh, uh, in the comfort of it of your home that I performed from the National uh, Medical Library. You can do this in the visible human server. You can see the cords are indeed located lateral to the artery in this position. <clears throat> in the, and this is again to show you how the cords are actually uh, related posterior and deep to the uh, clavicle and in relation to the serratus magnus muscle <clears throat> in the costoclavicular space. In fact, if you look at the literature, um, performing infraclavicular block at the proximal site uh, is not very original. It has been described much more earlier. And if you look further, I'm sure there is more further literature beyond 1995 where, where folks have performed brachial plexus at a much proximal site. It's just today we call it the costoclavicular brachial plexus block. In fact, Kilka described it in 1995 as a proximal infraclavicular brachial plexus block as a Kilka technique. As you can see here, this is our good old friend, uh, Belen Jose Maria from uh, Barcelona in this publication performing uh, a Kilka technique uh, just distal to the, just below the midpoint of the clavicle, they introduce the needle directly posteriorly uh, using nerve stimulation. So your patient cannot be uh, anesthetized with muscle relaxants. In this case, uh, I think it's just sedated. And you look for a response of the lateral cord, uh, uh, which usually because the lateral cord is usually more superficial, will be the first one to, to be uh, in contact with the needle. And then in those days when we didn't have ultrasound, one of the uh, one of the suggestions or advice that uh, were often uh, uh, were provided is when you get a lateral cord, and if you perform the injection, you get often sparing of the medial cord. You can see why, because the medial cord is indeed located posterior to the lateral cord in this uh, sagittal section. Uh, the suggestion was that you should, once you get a lateral cord response, you should insert the needle deeper till you get a medial cord. So... Uh, now you can say that, oh my God, uh, we were probably going through the lateral cord in most cases into, to in, indeed to elicit a medial cord response. But fortunately, nothing happened in those, uh, in those patients that we often performed the Kilka technique. Um, Cryomicrotome uh, cadaver dissection studies have also shown that the anatomy of the, of the cord, relationship of the cords in relation to the first part of the axillary art is very consistent. You can see here the green represents the medial cord, the yellow represents the lateral cord, and the orange represents the posterior cord. And these are consecutive sections from a medial to lateral uh, direction. I think they're about five millimeters apart. And then you can see that as the cords uh, go laterally, you can see they still maintain a very consistent anatomical relationship with relation to the cord. Now, um, in, in, for this discussion, I like to uh, highlight a few other anatomical uh, landmarks, or if I may, uh, that uh, will be useful when we perform the scan. The first one is the cephalic vein. You can see here the cephalic vein enters the deltopectoral groove, and then it swings across over the brachial plexus to join the cephalic vein medial to the axillary artery here. This is the first part of the axillary artery. Deep to it is the second part. And uh, distal to the inferior border of the pec minor is the inferior, sorry, is the third part of the axillary artery. And you can see how the cephalic vein swings over to, the, uh, to join the uh, axillary vein. Now, why this is important? Because while you are performing your scan at the costoclavicular space, if you happen to see the inferior, uh, if you see the cephalic vein, it's a telltale sign that your scan is too distal. So you need to move your transducer further more cephalad. Uh, also, it is not uncommon if you apply a lot of pressure, you may indeed compress this vein and inadvertently puncture the uh, cephalic vein. Probably not much consequence, but it's something that one needs to keep in mind. 
For this discussion also, let's describe the section which is above the um, upper border of the pec minor or the medial border of the pec minor uh, and the lower border of the clavicle as the medial infraclavicular fossa and anything that is deep to the pec minor as the lateral infraclavicular fossa. So when you look at the sagittal scan of the medial infraclavicular fossa, like we did when you performed a Kilka technique at the midpoint of the clavicle, and you inserted a needle perpendicular to and below the inferior midpoint of the lower border of the clavicle, this is the anatomy you would see. You can see here, this is the, to your left is cranial and to your right is caudal. You can see the acoustic shadow of the clavicle. And then anteriorly, you can see the, pec, the clavicular head of the pectoralis major muscle, uh, and it goes and attaches to the clavicle. And deep to that is the subclavius muscle. This is subclavius because it's attached to the clavicle. To the clavicle. And deep to that, you will see the pec minor, the upper border of the pec minor. And attached between these two is the clavipectoral fascia. You can see how the cephalic vein is coming from lateral to medial to join the axillary vein here. And then deep to the subclavius muscle, you can see the serratus magnus, which is the serratus anterior that is often attached to the second rib here. Uh, in this case, below the behind the clavicle. So again, this is uh, sometimes erroneously counted as the first rib. Actually, you can't count the first, identify the first rib below the clavicle with ultrasound. It's usually the second rib that is the first sonographically recognizable uh, rib deep to the clavicle. So you can see here between the serratus anterior and the subclavius, there is a hypoechogenic space in which the three cores of the brachial plexus are clustered together in a hyperechoic matrix of connective tissue. This is the lateral cord, most superficial to you. Deep to that is the medial cord. So if you remember that the lateral cord uh, is always superficial to the medial cord, and the posterior cord is always cranial and lateral to both these cords in, uh, if you did a transverse scan. So this arrangement has been described as a Phrygian cap. In, in France, they use this kind of cap, where you can see it looks like a Phrygian cap, that um, is there on this statue, as you can see here. So this is the first anatomical study that we've performed in our, in our series, looking at the anatomy of the costoclavicular space. So uh, in the images that you will see from here on, uh, whether they are cadaveric or ultrasonographic, to, you, to the top would be your cranial and to your left would be lateral, irrespective of the image that you see here. So you can see here, this is the clavicle and uh, deep to the clavicle, you can see the subclavius muscle. You can see the axillary vein. Obviously, it's a cadaver, so it's collapsed. You can see the axillary artery, and you can see the origin of the thoracoacromial artery from the um, first part of the axillary uh, artery here. And lateral to that, you can see the cords of the brachial plexus. Now here, the most superficial is the lateral cord. You can see the posterior cord, which is the lateral most of the three cords. Actually, you can't see the medial cord because it is located deep to the posterior cord. Now, if you cut off the midsection of the clavicle, you can see now how the subclavius muscle is related to the clavicle and how the uh, neurovascular structures are, are aligned in the sub at the, sub at the costoclavicular space. You can see the vein, the axillary artery, uh, and the lateral and the posterior cord. If we now retract uh, the, uh, lat the, sorry, the lateral cord medially, you can now see that deep to the lateral, lateral cord, you can now see the medial cord, which is much more deep in location. Uh, this is an anatomical section to show you um, the arrangement of the cords. They are all clustered together lateral to the axillary, second part of the first part of the axillary artery, I beg your pardon, and they are lying on top of the, uh, of the second rib and in relation to the serratus magnus muscle. Histologically, also in this location, and we discuss uh, at length about this during our brachial plexus uh, session uh, with the connective tissue sessions uh, in the last webinar. You can see here, this is indeed the lateral cord. You can see there are two fascicles of the lateral cord here, and the six represents the epineurium of the, of the lateral cord. The, the posterior cord, as I said, is more lateral, uh, and in, this is a lateral uh, transverse axial uh, section here. And this is your medial cord. Medial cord is always deep, deep to the lateral cord. So this arrangement is very consistent. And you will see this again and again as we perform these blocks. So having the, the three nerves 
or the three chords clustered together so close in this uh, costoclavicular space, to me occurred that it would be good because now if I could place my needle uh, in between these chords, then I not only have a recipe for having a very high success rate of all the three chords, but I could also place a catheter that would now be uh, ideal for anesthesia of all the three chords and possibly that too with using a relatively small volumes of local anesthetic. So that is actually the fundamental basis of a costoclavicular brachial plexus block. You can see here, when you look at the sagittal and the transverse view in the same uh, orient uh, in these location, you can see this is the Phrygian cap origin, uh, arrangement of the lateral anterior, medial posterior, and then the, the, sorry, the medial cord posterior and the posterior cord being more superficial. And when you look at it in the axial view, transverse view, you can see this arrangement. So now, once we understood the anatomy, we went on to perform the scans uh, and perform develop the block. In a transverse scan, you perform use a high frequency linear transducer. Uh, usually, place it uh, below the clavicle, just about the midsection of the clavicle. But having a having a systematic approach uh, or a sequential approach with anything uh, makes it more consistent. So I will try and hopefully uh, demonstrate that to you uh, about the costoclavicular scan, as I did uh, previously with the uh, interscalene uh, in the, in the, above the clavicle with the interscalene block. So uh, you can see here, uh, this is the orientation in which the ultrasound beam is insonated. You can see it's aimed to insonate the second rib so that uh, if you can see the second rib and the, and the serratus uh, anterior muscle overlying it, then the anatomy uh, intervening anatomy becomes much more clear. So keep that in mind. When you are performing a scan, you have to dynamically tilt the probe, slightly cephalad, so that you can insonate the, the second rib. So don't always try to look for the cords at first. Your objective, if you can get a good view of the serratus anterior and the second rib, voila, your cords will be right in front of you. This is the ergonomics that we use. You can see here. Uh, the arm is abducted. So one of the limitations of uh, the costoclavicular scan is um, that the technique that we describe is that the arm has to be abducted to perform the injection from a lateral to medial direction. And I will come to that in a minute. We do the scan in five sequential steps, as you can see here. Some of it is redundant as far as the injection technique, but it, it gives you a good understanding of the uh, adjacent anatomy. And at the same time, it, it, it tells you when your scan is not in the appropriate space. So uh, as the uh, volunteer here, you can see a linear scan is performed directly over the clavicle first. This is a good starting point because this is something that you can always identify. And then you slip the transducer just below the clavicle. You'll now see the peg major uh, muscle and you can see the subclavius. And then, as I said, in a slightly more caudal direction, you can see the, the cephalic vein coming from a lateral to medial direction. It actually swings over the three cores of the brachial plexus in the medial infraclavicular fossa. And at the costoclavicular space, you can see the three cords are actually clustered lateral to the axillary artery and deep to the subclavius muscle here and overlying the serratus anterior muscle. Look, you can see the anterior border of the serratus anterior very clearly. That's when your beam is at right angle to the nerves. So that's when you're going to see it best. Okay, this is a quick um, recollection. You can see the first window would be your clavicle. You just drop it underneath the clavicle. And you can see now the clavicular head of the pectoralis major, the subclavius. Of course, the, the transducer has to be tilted slightly cephalad till you can see the serratus anterior and the second rib very clearly. And lateral to the axillary artery, you can see a cluster of these three cords. The one that's most superficial to you is the lateral cord. Deep to that is the medial cord. And the most lateral of them all is the posterior cord. Again, if you go slightly more caudad, now you see the subclavius muscle is not, not visualized. So this is not a costoclavicular uh, space anatomy. This is indeed an, uh, an image of the upper part of the medial infraclavicular fossa where you can see the uh, the cephalic vein um, coming from a lateral to medial direction. But at the same time, you can see that the three cores of the brachial plexus are very clearly identified. Again, the relationship remains the same. You can see the lateral cord, 
the medial cord, and most lateral of them all is the posterior cord, lying on top of the serratus anterior muscle. If you go further caudad, you can now see the pec major and the minor muscle, and deep to that is the um, axillary, second part of the axillary artery and the vein. You can now see the emergence of the thoracoacromial artery. This is indeed the first branch of the, um, one of the main branches of the axillary artery, and it's usually given off either above the pec minor muscle or just at the upper border of the pec minor muscle. It also branches into uh, two divisions, and this again divides into two branches. If you want to remember the various branches of the uh, thoracoacromial artery, remember the uh, mnemonic that cadaver are dead people. Aren't they? Cadaver are dead people. So you have a clavicular branch, you have an acromial branch, you have a deltoid branch, and then you have a pectoral branch. So these two give off the, um, the lateral branches, two lateral branches, and these give off the two medial branches. So this is a sequence of scan that you, I, I just uh, referred to, from the clavicle to the costoclavicular space to the upper part of the medial infraclavicular space where you can see the cephalic vein, and deep to it, uh, you can see the uh, three cords. Now, why can, where can this be useful? Now, in some situations when you are not able to uh, visualize the cords in the costoclavicular space, you can use this as a surrogate marker where you can now identify the three cords here. And if you now dynamically scan more distally, you can track the individual cords. If you focus on one cord at a time, you can then track them more distally and get a clear visualization of the anatomy. So now this is the target ultrasound window where we are looking at the cords of the brachial plexus um, deep to the pec major and, and the subclavius muscle. Uh, and superficial to the serratus anterior muscle here. This is your serratus anterior muscle overlying the second rib and the three cords that are clustered together lateral to the um, first part of the axillary artery in the subclay, in the uh, costoclavicular space. As we um, referred to before uh, in our previous webinar that there is a collagen um, tissue, the circumneurium, of the, of the brachial plexus that actually surrounds the cords of the brachial plexus. And indeed, there is also a septum that becomes more visible uh, with an anterior and a posterior compartment um, once you inject the local anesthetic in most cases. So this is how the anatomy is, uh, is laid out when you look at the relationship of the cords from the um, costoclavicular space to the lateral sagittal infraclavicular space. You can see here, how the relationship of the three cords remain quite consistent, although there is these three cords, they rotate into their uh, respective position in relation to the, to the second part of the axillary artery. So if you remember this anatomical relationship and you um, identify the cord at, at one level, you can track them back and forth. So dynamically scanning these uh, cords and to look at their relationship to one another uh, can go a long way in uh, improving not only your knowledge, but sometimes identifying anatomical variations relating to that. This is also just to show you how uh, the anatomical relationship of these cords change as you go from the costoclavicular space to the lateral sagittal. And it's not surprising that when you perform an injection in the uh, costoclavicular space, it's much faster in onset and it's much more denser when you use low volumes of local anesthetic. And this is the basis of uh, some of our work that I will present in a short while. Now, while the um, costoclavicular anatomy of the brachial plexus is quite consistent, a word of caution, you may often find uh, a vessel that often uh, uh, crosses across this costoclavicular space uh, in between the cords. As you can see here, this is indeed a low takeoff of the dorsal scapular artery that usually comes out from the subclavian artery. But uh, I'm told by my good anatomical professor, Professor Morigal, that this is indeed could be uh, a, a low takeoff of the uh, dorsal scapular artery that comes off from the lateral aspect of the uh, axillary artery and lying deep to the lateral uh, and between the lateral and the medial cord. So, with this anatomical and sonoanatomical information, let's see uh, how we do a costoclavicular brachial plexus block again. Um, you do a transverse scan, identify the cords of the brachial plexus at the costoclavicular space. So this is lateral, and that would be medial. So this is the head end of the patient. You can see an assistant is helping me inject. 
We also have a pressure transducer here, injection pressure monitor. Uh, this was because we were using it in the early parts of our study uh, because we were injecting in a very compact uh, neural space. Uh, it, the aim is to guide your needle from a lateral to medial direction and then hydrodissect your way through between the lateral and the posterior cord and place the injection somewhere at the center of the nerve cluster. As you can see here, uh, the needle has been inserted and is positioned in the center and the local anesthetic. After the local anesthetic, you can see 20 ml of local anesthetic has created an ocean of, uh, of spread of these uh, to the three cords of the brachial plexus, culminating in a, a very rapid onset of sensory motor blockade of the upper extremity. Again, this is a sequence of image to show you how you would visualize the needle. So therefore, when you do a costoclavicular brachial plexus block, it is imperative, and I say it is imperative, that you continue to see the subclavius muscle. Because if you don't see the subclavius muscle, then that's not the costoclavicular space. It's uh, more distal, and it's in the medial infraclavicular fossa. And you can see here, once you inject the local anesthetic, it spreads quite uh, extensively to the, the three cords. Okay, so um, now when you talk about um, brachial plexus today, we often talk about extra fascial, sub -fascial, and we discussed at length uh, with um, Professor Bozart and Dr. Professor Reina, uh, the other uh, in the previous webinar as to how um, subfascial injections and what these uh, circumneural uh, injections, uh, circumneural sheath is. You can see here, although it is very difficult to define the circumneural sheath before the injection, but you can see here, even with this high definition ultrasound, uh, when you insert the needle, it's coming from a lateral to medial direction. As soon as you um, think you have gone through the uh, subclavius muscle, use uh, use uh, some normal saline to hydrodissect this area. You will see here, uh, as you uh, inject the saline, if you are, if you are extra fascial, then you will often see that uh, the, um, the cords are usually pushed away by the injectate. However, if you are subfascial, you will see separation of the cords, and you will see separation of the individual cords, which you may be able to appreciate in the next slide here, in this next. As you see, we are now at the center, and if you inject here, then you can see that the lateral cord is now separating from the posterior cord and the medial cord is more deeper. Now, uh, if you um, are using nerve stimulation, then use D5 water, dextrose 5%, and you will see the same effect. You can see now, so inherently, uh, the uh, costoclavicular block is a subfascial injection because it is now deep to the, um, uh, to the circumneural sheath surrounding the... Um, the brachial plexus at this level. You can see here, you can see a sausage-like um, appearance of the distended uh, cost the brachial plexus um, uh, elements at the costoclavicular space. Um, this is something we uh, have demonstrated at length in our, in our recent work in uh, region anesthesia pain medicine. You can see here in this, another patient, you can see how clearly you can see the distension of the circumneural sheath. You can also see that uh, the circumneural sheath uh, not only surrounds the cords, but also it is an all-inclusive neurovascular sheath. As you can see again here, it is also encompasses part of the uh, axillary artery and the vein. Uh, and it also has a septum, you can see that goes through the uh, circumneural sheath here, so that the lateral cord is usually in an anterior compartment and the medial and the posterior cord are in a posterior compartment. So this is a septum that uh, has been we have we discussed about in our in our previous webinar. So the septum uh, is a structure that you will not see before the injection, but once you perform the local anesthetic injection, I believe that it causes the uh, the matrix of connective tissue uh, that lie between these cords to um, to congregate or aggregate in such a way that it produces the septum. And this septum is actually a fibro fatty collagenous septum that is uh, within uh, this circumneural sheath. Histologically, you can see here, there's a lot of collagen fibers that surround the, the cords at this level. Uh, and once you perform the injection at the center, it, the uh, collagen fibers and fat all come together as the local anesthetic spreads. And this probably produces that septal effect that you see here. This is at the second part, as you can see the pec minor. And you can see here, this is a very clear depiction uh, 
of the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment with the um, with the with the medial and the post and the posterior cord in this case and some branches are, are coming off the the lateral cord so there are two compartments now we are familiar with the anterior and the posterior compartment with the septum and the septum actually comes off the axillary artery while the circumneural sheath is a, a is a is a all encompassing neurovascular sheath so what happens if you perform a costoclavicular brachial plexus block with 0.5% ropivacaine, 20 mLs. This is what we did in our initial first study. We found, you can see here, that this is loss of sensation to cold in the, um, the y-axis here. And you can see in the x-axis is the time. So within 30 minutes, you can see there's a rapid decline in sensory motor, sensory um, sensation to cold in all the distributions of the median, ulnar, radial, and muscular cutaneous nerve. And there's also... Uh, a slower but rapid decline in motor function, so much so that within 30 minutes, they're all almost uh, uh, ready for, for surgery. We also did a randomized control trial um, looking at the lateral and the, and the costoclavicular brachial plexus block. So the blue represents the lateral sagittal infraclavicular and the yellow represents the, the uh, costoclavicular brachial plexus block. When we look at the loss of sensation to cold, the sensory scores were significantly lower in uh, the uh, costoclavic at all time points during this, this study period. When we looked at our primary outcome variable, which was the time to readiness for surgery, this is a criteria that we frequently use in our clinical practice, say that when your sensation is less than 30 and your patient exhibits some degree of motor weakness, then that patient is ready for uh, for 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 to, to be handed over to the surgeon because by the time they uh, finish their preps and they finish their draping and uh, and talking, then patients, the blocks are usually ready. So you can see here that time to readiness for surgery was almost um, uh, almost half that in, in the lateral sagittal infra and was highly significant. However, there are also studies from other research groups documenting that there are no differences in uh, uh, sensory motor blockade or other criterias when you compare infraclavicular, lateral sagittal to costoclavicular. Uh, however, I, I must warn you that there are differences in uh, in uh, in the different studies. Uh, although this this group demonstrated similar onset times, uh, the differences may be related to the study was conducted in in Canada, so they have larger body build. They have used much larger volumes of local anesthetic, 35 ml versus 25 ml, and they use drugs like lidocaine, which have a very rapid onset of block. So irrespective of whatever technique you use, use of lidocaine may sometimes circumvent the usefulness of one technique over another. And different um, uh, outcome criteria of sensory motor block assessments were used. And I believe uh, to expect complete sensory motor loss in any clinical situation is probably a little uh, too stringent in terms of when you're looking at it in clinical practice. The same group also have demonstrated that the ED95 or the minimum volume requirement, local anesthetic volume requirement is 35, 35 ml, 34 ml, and they seem to use 35 ml for almost all their blocks. So uh, I think in this day when we are using ultrasonography and we are using smaller volumes of local anesthetic, this would be an excessive volume in my clinical practice. In our group of pop, uh, patients in, in Hong Kong, we have demonstrated that 21 mils is the uh, ED95 using a similar methodology. We found the MEV90 of uh, ropibacaine 0.5% as 25. This is in agreement with the more recent study in anesthesiology by this group, by Dr. Keolani and group et al. And they have demonstrated uh, uh, ED95 of of 19 mils. So therefore in clinical practice, we don't use uh, more than 25 cc's. Now you don't need 25, but if you want a much more rapid onset uh, and a much more denser block of a longer duration, then 25 mil is quite safe for most patients. So this is why we use 25 mils in our clinical practice. Uh, also, this is a study that Dr. Shiva Shanmungam from um, Pondicherry in India did, and I collaborated with them looking at ipsilateral hemidiaphragmatic paresis following supraclavicular and acostoclavicular block. We found that when you perform subfascial uh, supraclavicular block compared to, to the subfascial 
uh, costoclavicular brachial plexus block, there was a significantly lower incidence of uh, hemidiaphragmatic paresis. Well, it was 45% in the cost in the supraclavicular block. It only affected one patient, i.e., 5% in uh, in the uh, in the costoclavicular block. So, therefore, it is indeed more phrenic nerve sparing in terms of diaphragmatic paresis. Uh, also, although there were uh, there were decrements in um, the hemidiaphragmatic uh, in uh, diaphragmatic excursion, the uh, there were also changes in uh, big expiratory flow rate before and after the block, but none of them was statistically significant, and none of these patients in this cohort exhibited any uh, clinical signs of decompensation. But one must remember that these are patients uh, with no preoperative respiratory disability. Also, a recent uh, cadaver study by Dr. Koyala Mundi and the group from, um, uh, from Arizona in the United States in a cadaver study demonstrated that when you perform a costoclavicular brachial plexus block, it not only spreads cranially and caudally to affect even up to the some of the nerve, nerve, the ventral ramus of C7, C8, and T1, but also it just spreads quite extensively distally. Um, one of the things I think uh, some um, uh, folks that are not familiar with uh, the research uh, may say that, oh, when there is coloring, there is anesthesia. Unfortunately, coloring does not mean uh, anesthesia or analgesia. It just means that there is an anatomical pathway for spread of the drug or the injectate to that target level. So you can see here in these five um, dissections that they did, you can see that after costoclavicular block, you can spread all the way up to C7, T1, ventral ramus. It affects all the three trunks. This is good news. This is pretty much like the SETV because we in SETV, we are trying to um, selectively identify these age, these trunks and, and block them. Uh, but here you're performing a, 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 a costoclavicular block and you're still able to um, stain the three nerves. I'm not saying block the three uh, trunks because blocking uh, these trunks is much more uh, than meets the eye than just staining these uh, three trunks. Uh, so, but nevertheless, it affects all the three lateral and medial and posterior cords, so it produces very uh, rapid onset of effect. Interestingly, it also affects the suprascapular nerve, and therefore, uh, in recent time, is also being used as a non-inferior analgesic technique for uh, for uh, shoulder surgery. And given that, it also affects the lateral cord, the posterior cord, and some of the nerves, other nerves that supply the uh, the shoulder joint with the suprascapular nerve. Uh, it's not surprising that it produces non-inferior analgesia, but it has a greater uh, hemidiaphragmatic paresis or, or say phrenic nerve palsy sparing effect. You can also, so what do you do if you, if you are unable to abduct the arm in these patients? A medial approach or a medial variant has been described, uh, and this does not require the arm to be abducted. All you then do is to insert the needle from a medial to a lateral direction, and um, Dr. Sala Blanche and the group from Barcelona also uh, described that this technique may have advantage because now the needle is not being directed towards the pleura. It's actually going away from the pleura more towards the rib. So I think for novices, this may also be another uh, way to perform the block. As long as you remember that you perform the block between the lateral cord and the, and the, and the axillary artery, and then perform an injection deeper, uh, closer to the medial, medial cord. Would you do a single or a multiple injection? Um, uh, there are now um, some research data available, randomized controlled trials showing that uh, a single injection, when you compare a single injection to a double injection technique, uh, a double injection technique has a much faster onset of, of sensory block. Uh, sensory onset uh, uh, and total anesthesia related times are, are shorter here. In this case, you have a shorter onset. Uh, this group, again, also I think from, um, from mainland China have demonstrated that a triple injection as opposed to a single injection, a triple injection, identifying the individual cause and injection may be, um, may be desirable when you want uh, earlier onset of, of uh, anesthesia and the three nerves. As you can see here, the triple injection achieve a higher rate of complete sensory motor blockade at 30 minutes. So what about catheter? This is the final uh, aspect about this technique that I'm going to discuss before we uh, end. So we've done some preliminary experience with this. As I said, 
placing a catheter at the center of the cluster is a subfascial placement. And being able to place it right at the center of the cluster is again um, probably beneficial because now your local anesthetic can spread to all the three codes. So uh, as you can see here, the patient is lying supine with the arm abducted. Uh, we do a transverse scan with a high frequency linear transducer, sterile aseptic precautions, and we use a transparent drape. So this allows you to not only see the anatomy, but also see if you're looking for any motor response. Somebody uh, asked, uh, where do you source these um, plastic drapes? Unfortunately, I don't know where you can get them in Indonesia, sir, but I'm sure if you uh, look around your, uh, your providers in, uh, in your country, you will find somebody who will have these drapes for you. And as you see, it can be quite useful when you're doing these blocks. So we use a, a, a catheter over needle, which is, um, there are a number of them in the market today. This is the ECAT that uh, we are using here. The, the, the reason I, I use these catheters because uh, is that uh, you insert the needle to the point where you want to leave the catheter because there is no need to thread the catheter. Besides, because the catheter is larger than the needle, there's often no back leakage through the skin puncture hole. As you can see here, you can very effectively um, secure the catheter because it has another introducer inside and it almost becomes unkinkable and unobstructable because of the anatomic of the uh, of the uh, engineering uh, involved in the catheter design. You can see here the needle is introduced from a lateral to medial. Once the needle uh, tip has uh, been placed in the site and we've injected a bolus of dextrose or, or the local anesthetic, we just remove the, the stalet and the catheter uh, obturator is introduced inside and then with an extension, the catheter is secured in place. And you can see here, the catheter tip can be seen, in fact, lying overlying this, the serratus anterior muscle. In fact, the pool of local anesthetic has lifted the cords of the brachial plexus. It's quite easy to secure it. And um, one of the advantages we find, although, again, the experience is quite lacking all around, there are not many published data, but in clinical practice, I now rarely use more than five or six mils of, of 0.1 to 5% infusion through these catheters in the post-operative period, and they seem to provide quite effective analgesia for, uh, for, 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 for post-operative pain relief. Again, you can also place catheters, and this is a, a catheter that we often use also. This is a silver stem catheter by, uh, from uh, Vigon. And they're also very useful, very echogenic, and can be uh, placed through the needle. But this is a, a catheter through needle, uh, like your Tuhi needle, et cetera. Uh, and they can also be used to stimulate the, um, the neural elements. So it gives you a dual kind of uh, function and can be quite useful when you can come to respect to this. So concluding remarks after such a long uh, winded uh, presentation is that the anatomy of the brachial plexus is very unique when it comes to brachial plexus block. I've also demonstrated to you that the sonar anatomy of the brachial plexus of the cause of the costoclaviculus is very unique, very consistent, and you can indeed uh, uh, place a needle very effectively at the center of the cluster uh, within the uh, within the costoclavicular space. An injection of 20 to 25 mils of local anesthetic, which is the ED95, produces very rapid onset of sensory motile blockade. Uh, it produces sensory blockade um, readiness for surgery that much faster than a lateral sagittal infraclavicular brachial plexus block. You can understand it because the anatomical features uh, allow you to 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 um, produce very rapid onset of block with lower volumes. However, if you use large volumes of local anesthetic, as the literature suggests, there will be no difference. So therefore, if you have a patient who is probably uh, frail, elderly, and you don't want uh, them to be um, at the risk of uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity, then maybe costoclavicular, because it provides uh, good eff efficacy with low volumes, may again be desirable. Um, there is definitely a potential for pleural puncture, but if you consider the anatomy and you have the appropriate dexterity, then uh, pleural puncture is, is not an issue. Ipsi lateral hemidiaphragmatic paresis is less than supraclavicular and infraclavicular brachial plexus, um, or uh, sorry, uh, interscalene brachial plexus block. And today uh, it's also being used for a shoulder surgery. So I think when you look at costoclavicular block, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it looks like this big fish. You can see the sailfish 
uh, that uh, we caught off the coast in, in Malaysia. So uh, if you go on an adventure uh, in your life and you find once in a while, you find some good things. I think in my journey in regional anesthesia, I think osteoclavicular block has been one of those that I can count as a good find because I think this is a, a block that is here to stay. And, uh, I, and, I, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm sure long before or long after I've gone, uh, from this field of regional anesthesia, it will still be uh, knocking on on the doors of many regional anesthesia uh, block rooms and and uh, and uh, operating rooms. Uh, so, with these few words, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention.